There we go. Great. So welcome to um, raid meeting number six. So uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, so we've been working on a whole lot of different things and um, didn't have an interest to be all organized. Um, but uh, it's great to see everybody. And we've got some demos and we've got some uh, you know different announcements and things to talk about this week. Um, so yeah, uh, so to kick it off, um, I'm going to have the meeting page open. If anyone else wants to follow along, you're welcome to pull up the same thing. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, Mike and I had a chat about what our you know vague goals are this year, um, or like you know not this year but in the next little while. Um, so there's sort of three things that we want to get done, um, which would you know once we've got them all done, I think Braid will be in a much better place. So we want to get uh, Braid 0.3, the the next version of the spec, out and done. Um, we want to get some decent implementations of um, Braid itself, and we want to have a decent website. So basically, we want people to be able to go to the website, find out what Braid is, read the spec, there's a decent spec out, and um, and try it out using different implementations. Uh, so that's, um, uh, yeah, that's the rough goal. Um, thanks, Mike. Yeah, sweet. So we've got, um, from the perspective of the homepage, we had a meeting last week where we um, talked about a whole lot of different things we all care about, and there was some amazing stuff that came from that, and that's meeting-5, if anyone's interested in looking at it. Um, so meeting five, we brainstormed a whole lot of things that like what we all care about braid. And um, if anyone wants to feel inspired, it's a really great place to look. Uh, we're going to organize a meeting at some point. I'm not sure if it'll be next week or the week after to actually start summarizing and collating all that stuff down into what the homepage looks like. Um, uh, we'll make announcements on Discord. Uh, I think um, it might be partially based on whether or not Mike's around um, in the next week or two, since he's in Hawaii right now. Um, and then from the perspective of the spec, so we've got uh, an increasing number of GitHub issues. Um, I I'm personally feel vaguely stressed <laughs> that the number of GitHub issues is rising and not falling. Uh, I want it to be falling. There's a lot of different things we've got to discuss. So we've got, um, there's a 0.3 milestone that we've um, assigned to some issues. And after demos today, we'll go through some of those issues to see if we can close any of them. But uh, I want to start pushing towards actually, you know, closing some issues so we can get a new version of the spec out. And there's a whole lot more issues that we've talked about that will end up making it for 0.4. But um, yeah, I think we need more of a concerted effort to close things. Um, yeah, Mike. Yeah, I just want to say that I think um, a general theme of these three items, the homepage, spec, uh, you know, Braid HTTP 03, and these libraries is that we're getting a bunch of use happening now. I think the last version of the spec we didn't get that many implementations of it we had like a you know maybe one but we didn't really build apps with it either and now we're getting libraries that's gonna make it easy to build apps and the home page i think is going to represent like here's all the stuff that we can build and so it's, it feels like these three things are coming together a lot too with this this new dimension of of our group so i just want to say that yeah totally um yeah i'm really keen to start seeing some actual software on top of all this it's, it's like we've been talking about it for so long uh, but yeah, um, uh, and then there's the perspective of the libraries. So Dwayne's been helping us out and uh, Mike and I have both been working on, we've each got a different implementation, but we're talking about maybe merging some of that code together um, to have like unofficial reference implementation of RAID, which might be sweet. Uh, and um, yeah, in my demo today, I'm gonna show that now, you know, which is very exciting. Now my implementation of the RAID spec and Mike's implementation are uh, almost compatible, um, which is actually really nice to see. So uh, the code itself is in a reasonably good spot. And um, I want to, yeah, we'll put in some more time over the next little while getting, you know, um, some tests and getting all the different bits and pieces that we need done for that. So uh, yeah, so that's the state of the braid at the moment. Um, does anyone have any other comments on that before we move on to demos? We could also do a round of just status too, which might be good. Yeah, actually that would be good. Let's do that quickly. Um, so. Mike, do you want to start, kick us off? Sure. Um, so, um, okay. So my main focus this week has been on this Bradify release, uh, Bradify software. So this is a protocol implementation that you can use in your applications to upgrade web apps to Braid or add Braid features. Um, and it's, I'm going to give a demo of that. And also organizing this mono repo. So this is a place for um, it's, it's, it's a repo where we can put code that's all versioned together and, and we can reuse each other's code. I'll talk about that too. And 
I was really happy about our homepage design meeting last week. So kind of the main work I've been doing is getting this code working and organizing our software so we can build stuff. Um, but also in this, this homepage meeting, I thought we had um, a lot of, it, it seemed like I was surprised to see how many kind of philosophical ideas we have in common about what we see as our angle as braid for creating a distributed web. And so I think that we got a bunch of, I, and I'm, so that in that meeting, we got a, everyone's ideas, I think, captured, at least in that meeting. And that's going to give us a lot of good fodder for building the homepage next. So I'm now um, going to have another 10 days or 11 days in Hawaii. And it's nice to have this break. And I'm going to be doing some kind of high level thinking, thinking, trying to do some homepage stuff and also writing up what I think our possibility might be here and trying to take the ideas that everyone's putting out and trying to thread them all together into something. Because I think that we're presenting a big new face with making something that people can use to build the decentralized web right now on top of the existing web. And you just kind of need to like put these big pieces together. Um, so my focus for the next week is going to be writing some things up. So I'm going to be writing some stuff about Braid. I'm going to write up the, um, might also be writing up the antimatter algorithm, which like we keep showing demos of, would be really good to express that. Um, and then working on the homepage, working on talking about distributed state and what's, what's unique about our opportunity here to make a new programming model. We've been talking a lot about this abstraction for dis distributed state. And so I'm, I've been doing a little like just research into the related work. What are the other programming models? How does this compare? Because there's something fundamentally new here that's enabled by programming with CRDTs. Um, and so I want to try to try to I'm thinking about trying to get that up. And then um, and then the last thing is I would love to have more use of the Bradify library so that and I want to just like revise it. Like we've got a beta now. And so I'd love to get feedback. And I want to make make that code stronger so it's easier to, to build on for everyone's uses. Um, that's my status. Cool. Do you want to pick someone to pass the torch to? Um, maybe Greg, because I just saw you clapping. <laughs> I was, I was indeed clapping. Oh man, the, the noise outside just calmed down right now, which is, uh, which is great. Um, I am, <clears throat> I'm working on a couple of things with Braid, uh, both of which I'll be showing a demo of, so I don't need to say too much about them right now. Uh, but one of them is a, um, is sort of, uh, a task to, um, basically to kind of uh, demonstrate or push, uh, push trying to get, uh, well, specifically this demo is getting auto merge to speak braid to itself. Um, and the other thing is a, is just a side idea. It's another CRDT that has kind of uh, captured a little bit of my interest. It does not synchronize arrays or strings, but it synchronizes everything else uh, with a very small amount of code. Um, and I am creating this because I, I want it for, for a, a task, and, um, at least two tasks that I've seen, and both of which are kind of synchronizing game state uh, across the machines. Anyway. That anyway was me ending. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Cool. Yeah, I'll pass, pass the, the on to someone. Oh, is to it her. my is it my responsibility to choose? <laughs> uh, uh, Seth. <laughs> I guess I wrote that on myself. Um, uh, sorry about the uh, typing sense before. I think I don't know what my laptop's doing. Um, the uh, yeah, cool. So this last week I've been. Um, uh, there's kind of two different things that I've been focusing my attention on. One of them is on uh, getting Braid protocol in a better place. So I want to publish an NPM module, and I was intending on doing that before this meeting, but I'm trying to get a bunch of different little bits and pieces done before I do that. So uh, I want to clean out some of the names of types and you know the names of the interfaces so that there's no, not much API churn if people start building on top of it. Um, so I've got that in a reasonably good place, uh, fixed up some compatibility bugs, which I'll show in the demos. And um, altogether, I think it's in a much better place. 
Uh, and there's also this aspect of like pulling it apart a bit into um, high and low level APIs, but we'll talk about that in the demos part. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot, which is a more interesting aspect, is um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about the um, having like a grander demo. I want to make like a Brett Victor style demo of what I think Braid is or what we're trying to do, at least from my point of view. And I've started sketching together like a you know a demo, right? Like you know on a piece of paper with a series of bullet points for now of what I want to show. Uh, so I'm going to start putting that together over the next little while. This is my plan um, to put together something that's like here's here's the view of computing that I want to have. Like here's how I want computing to look like, not just what I want Braid to be, but how I want myself and other people to be able to interact with computers. So that's been occupying some of my time. And I think the, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the final form of that is going to be, but um, yeah, it's a talk I'd love to give and record and post in Hacker News and talk about and blog about things like that as, you know, here's, here's a way forward. So yeah, so that's the other thing that I've been thinking about. Um, that, yeah, I just comment on that. Um, I so I'm drinking caffeine, so I'm talking a lot. But I got really excited about. Um, I, so I talked to Seth a little bit last week about this this uh, vision he has of making a demo. And I think there's a lot of juice for our group. I think like, uh, Angela, you just turned on your video, and you've been making cool demos too. And I think that there's like a new style of of web that that we're stepping into here. And I'm we haven't been doing that much like group demo work before. And I just got like. When Seth was talking about the demo he wanted to make, I was like, oh yeah, I want that too. And so I'm kind of excited about the possibility of us like hashing these visions around and making a bunch of cool stuff too. And um, also on that topic, I think next Monday, um, I'm talking to uh, Paul Kuchenko about doing that meeting um, about how you could program on Braid. So this might be also kind of like a demo or something. It's like, we normally program on the file system. We write our source code, it saves, good saves and files. We synchronize it with Git. We publish with NPM or, you know, Cargo, whatever your, your language ha has. We can do all that stuff on Braid. It's going to be pretty exciting and a radical different experience for programming, I think. So um, thinking we might do that on, on this coming Monday. Um, and in general, I just want to open the conversation to like demo discussions too. Uh, or just like encourage more of that. Because um, I think especially like when we're talking about this, having more perspectives on it and even more code, you know, and more little little tie-ins and stuff, I think is going to be exciting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Um, yeah, and Mike was also talking about what other demos we might want to make based on the big list of homepage ideas. And I'd love to see some more things like that. Uh, but in any case, I'm going to pass the conch to Angelo. I guess I asked for that, <laughs> turning my video on. Um, yeah, uh, so I uh, create needed a way to abstract what I was doing with my Colorama sliders um, so that I didn't have to manually sort of mount a slider to a JSON element. So I just wrote this thing called roots Roots DB, Roots JS. It's probably all three of those are taken, but I don't think so. Uh, it's just like 20 lines of code. Um, it import or it requires Braid HTTP client, which is the one that I'm writing, but I will gladly jump on one of yours. Um, and then JSON patch and JSON pointer, and like 20 lines of code. And it kind of gives me that feeling of uh, uh, the. Well, Mike, what is your, uh, what was that library that you were writing? The Gradify library or um, State Bus? State Bus. Yeah, th those were the demos that really sort of got me going um, in the beginning. And now I'm finally sort of like implementing that with Braid. Um, and like I said, I'm like 20 lines of code. So now I'm kind of ready to start putting this places. And so what I'm doing is I'm building an extension for like creation stuff for my site and then like this roots to sort of enliven the page currently so uh once a post has been created then i can go to the page and i can just start editing it and it'll like crdt like every character when that's all set up but then like when everything settles down i can click like save and it'll do the old school indie web mechanism to sort of publish an update um so have like one little interface do it all. <laughs> and 
and that's kind of my been my epiphany this last couple of weeks. That's cool. I'd like to see what you're doing. Um, are you planning to give a demo during this session, or should I catch up with you later? If there's still time at the very end, I can like do something real quick, uh, but I don't have anything official. Uh, but no, the Brett Victor thing, like I'm having flashbacks to you know those good old times. So I I'm on that page. Oh, and yeah, I'll I'll if if it gets to me, I'll I'll show you a couple of other things, like an icon editor. I saw an auto merge demo that had like they went and got an icon eight bit editor and like auto merged it <laughs> and uh I, now i have this svg icon editor that i've actually like wrote for myself to actually use because svg tools aren't that great in my opinion um and uh, now i just really want to gratify it i don't know again what what the immediate benefit will be but there's a grid and i'm just like thinking about it Anyway, uh, I, I want to braidify all the things and then like the Brett Victor uh, demo just sort of like appears before us. And I'll pass it off to Bryn. You said to me? Yeah. Cool. You um, yeah, let's see. What have we been up to? So Chris and I had been really focused on trying to get this um, this chat app uh, as far along as possible. And so in service of that, we've been working on an assortment of different problems, uh, like uh, improvements to the peer-to-peer -peer layer. Um, we've been working on the UX around identity, which is kind of notoriously tough in the decentralized space. Uh, I've been working on uh, making it possible to do private DMs instead of just public state that's shared by everybody. Um, and we're hoping in a couple of weeks at the next one of these to be at a place where we can really show it off and I don't know, maybe even replace Discord with it uh, before too long. Um, so great. By the way, what's that? That'd be so great. I can't wait to get, I, I love Discord <laughs> more than everything else, but I'd love to replace it. Yeah. Um, and by the way, since since I have the baton or whatever, uh, it sounds like the meeting about code coding on Braid is next Monday, not this time around, right? It hasn't been scheduled yet, but we've been talking about next Monday. Yeah. What do you okay. feel? Do you have a desire? Uh, that's fine with me. I had prepared my Git demo for this week, but I can happily, I, it would make more sense, I think, to kind of keep it coherent. So I can just do that when we do that meeting. Um, but yeah, excited to show you guys this stuff. Cool, uh, because you have a an interaction with Git and your and Redwood, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it serves as a Git backend, distributed, truly distributed Git backend. That's really cool. We could use that too, maybe. <laughs> Need some polish. But, um, that'd, be, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I have to hand it off, right? Uh, yeah. Let's do Ben. Oh uh, no, I, uh, I I have absolutely zero updates <laughs> from last time. So that, that's the quickest handoff ever. Uh, how about we pass off to uh, Raphael or Chris? Then and weren't you saying that you were thinking about doing another read off of the sub specs or something? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. If uh, someone's interested, if anyone's interested in that, uh, that could be something worth doing. Uh, doing a read off of the, um, like a reading slash walkthrough of the, uh, what would you call it? The more minor specifications, the range patch, the uh, merge types, and the link uh, JSON uh, specifications. So that could be something uh, upcoming that can be started instantaneously. Uh, if anyone's interested. I would actually be interested in doing a reading group and reading through it together and Ooh. commenting. Oh, that's it. a good idea. Let's talk about this in a minute. Rafi's got to go in a minute. and has got to run off to dinner. So let's get his check-in and then we can loop back yep. on that. Oh, yeah, well, I don't, I mean, I haven't really been like keeping in touch. Um, I'm, I'm just joining this meeting this week because uh, I'm hoping that I can be part of Braid again this summer um, in this group. And so I'm kind of trying to get back in the um in the loop right now um with the 
with how the project is going overall, basically. But I haven't been doing anything. So yeah. It's exciting to be here. Rapi worked on some um, integrations between a lot of the auto, uh, the um, antimatter stuff and ChattyB and different things, uh, like a, what, a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, it was the last two summers. Hmm. A lot nice. of the stuff on the Braid homepage right now has Raf's hands in it. A lot of those demos and visualizations. It's back when he was young, apparently. Am I not still young? <laughs> <laughs> Guess I'm getting old now. All right. <laughs> cool. Um, that'll be a great to have you. Cool. Sweet. Um, sorry, uh, Ben and Mike, you guys were talking about um, doing a, a reading. Yeah. So I'd be I'd be very happy to participate in a a collaborative reading. I think Ben, you you, you like that idea? So yeah. 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 Yeah, it'll be uh, interesting. Um, I so think, Sofa, you're the only one who listened to that first reading. So maybe you can provide your thoughts on it, Michael. Maybe entice some other people. <laughs> yeah, I found it really useful to see another perspective on it, too. It's kind of like a user test, because um, we want these specs to be clear. And uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Uh, doing like a reading group there because, you know, the idea is you read it out loud, uh, but then also add commentary for beginners um, or even work through some of the issues of it as you're going through the specification and kind of add a discussion. So having kind of two people in on that would be quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea, actually. Um, maybe on that, I added um, in the uh, work page. I added a, a mention of that so we can schedule that meeting at some point. Cool. But yeah, that'd be sweet. Uh, lucky last? No, yes. Who hasn't gone? Uh, is it just Chris? Oh, yeah, so uh, I've been working again on the Redwood chat app. Primarily this week, I worked with the account, so creating importing or signing into existing accounts. So, so previously you would only have one account, but now we have it to where you can have any number of accounts that you can sign in and we're encrypting them with a the password. So you can't just freely log in. It's never a good day to save a mnemonic encrypted. That's cause for error. But um, the other thing that Bruno and I have discussed is uh, I run a YouTube channel. Uh, it has about 18,000 subscribers. It's development focused. And I want to start doing a series of videos over Braid, Redwood, and the development of this chat application that we're doing. So I'm going to put more of a grand plan for how that'll look, but I'm open to suggestions for any video ideas. I have all the equipment to just get started and fire that stuff up. So if you guys have any ideas or maybe you want to do a video over one of the demos that you guys have, that would be cool. What's the uh, what's the general idea? Of, like, what do you want to express in these in these videos, and who's the audience that you're imagining? So the audience that currently follows me is front end developers, back end developers, uh, lean more heavily towards JavaScript. Uh, there's a little bit of design in there, but with these videos, I want to kind of demonstrate first the the protocol Braid JS protocol, and the specific Redwood implementation of the immutable state tree. Uh, I have a, a lot of friends that are interested in getting this type of technology. So I, I guess the spin that I'm initially going to go on is demonstrating how we built the chat application, how it works, how you sign transactions, your public private key. So I'm going to start kind of with the basics and then start to scale up more towards advanced concepts, but that's a general idea. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I could also imagine building, like doing a, a video just, you know, as a like, yeah, here's how you can get some state updating live just using the braid libraries uh, and what that looks like and you know separately so like that can exist as a front end back end like i'm just building a website on top of my server and then okay cool if you've got things like this then you know then there's the redwood piece that you can optionally add in yeah the cool thing is is um you know for my mo more front end developer following mm -hmm. uh bridging the gap that you know maybe they haven't done too much back end but being able to like for, for our case we built like a redwood hook that you can just define a state tree 
and start mutating and sending patches to that. That's all done with the front end, right? With a, with a node running in the background. So I think that would be cool to, to have someone build their own application without having mm -hmm. to touch, you know, doing a separate backend language. Right, right. Like use Redwood like you would with Firebase or something like that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, cool. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Uh, just because Chris is so humble, the YouTube channel is uh, Learn With Coffee. <laughs> so... <laughs> oh, I see. Nice. Yeah, if you guys want to subscribe, feel free. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe and like. <laughs> uh, yeah, smash that bell. We'll, we'll really bump your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Is um, there, Chris, is there something you could use help or support on for that in particular? Uh, not that I can think of off the top of my head right now. I mean, any, any concepts that you guys might think would be valuable to do a video over, I'd be more than happy to like have a meeting, go over some of the topics you think we should go over, and then I can do the video. Or if you guys want to be a part of the video, I'm open to that. Cool. I'd be interested in both of those. So okay. maybe, maybe I'll message you afterwards or something. Are you on the Discord? Yes. Great. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, and I love it, and thank you uh, for what it's worth. Sorry, do I need to say something? I was just, uh, didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say I can do my status update with the demo. Cool. Oh, right, you haven't gone yet. <laughs> I was like, I saw we're missing somebody. Um, cool. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to demos then. Um, uh, I'm, I'm first on the list, so I guess I will go first. Uh, so we've got a lot of demos today, and just um, for the interest of time, since I don't want to go over the two hour mark, I'm going to keep everybody um, at or under 10 minutes. So um, when I say at or under, I mean, like, please take less than 10 minutes. Uh, if we, you go over 10 minutes, we'll need to move on just because we've got a lot of stuff to get through. Um, so I'm going to try and be as short as I can, or like pretty short. I've got, um, I do have something to show. Uh, is it going to let me screen share my that. There we go. Um, so this is what I've been working on. So this is um, so this is Braidify. So this is Mike's Mike's uh, Braidify library. Um, so I've got a little server, and then this is just using the code that's in the um, that's in the README. So I can run the test client, and I get back a series of updates. So uh, this is actually a bit naughty. I'm not updating the version. The version should change every time the data changes. But we can see the body is Greg, and then a random number with math at random. So that works just fine. Um, so this already worked before. Uh, I'm going to stop that. Uh, this is my um, Braid protocol library. So this demo just uh, broadcasts the time every every second. So um, so I can connect to that. Um, sorry, uh, like that. Um, and this is the updated version of my CLI. Sorry, I should have adjusted font sizes. I can't tell how big everything is. So I can see I'm getting uh, the time every second, and it's just sending the time over braid, um, which is nice. Um, so so far so good. This I could have shown this off, you know, weeks ago. But the very exciting thing now is I can also take this server uh, and take the URL for this, take my watch script, paste that in here, and I'm subscribed from Braid Protocol to uh, to the Braidify code. So right now, this is actually giving us back updates with a UN8 array. Um, it's not showing the actual content. And the reason for that is that there's no content type coming through this document. So um, so my script doesn't know what type of what uh, how to parse the UN8 array. Um, so that's the reason for that. But that works, which is very exciting. And then likewise, uh, I've got my server here, and I can take the um, Braidify client and take that URL and paste that here, and I get a series of updates with new versions um, with the new time um, each second. So, ta da! We've got intercompatibility between the two different JavaScript Braid libraries. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, there's two bugs. Oh, sorry, well, there's a few bugs that came up. Um, a few of them have been fixed. There's two outstanding issues that are like monkey patched right now in this demo. One of them is that uh, that Braidify assumes that there's going to be an extra new line between updates. So I've manually added an extra new line to get around that bug. And then the other one is um, that the, uh, my server is sending slash r slash ends for new lines within headers. And the Braidify library is uh, 
only like slash ends, um, and that's. Uh, but Mike's gonna you know work on that. So hopefully you know with no changes, they should just both be intercompatible. But um, yeah, otherwise we've got intercompatibility between the spec implementations. So yeah, um, so which is very exciting. And I want to uh, have a special shout out to, to Dwayne for a lot of help implementing the um, the patches and adding adding um, multiple patch support into the Braid protocol library. Um, this wouldn't be possible without that code that you added. So, yeah. Um, Thank you. I feel like we just saw ARPANET connect two universities. <laughs> <laughs> so the next demo we need for that is when one of these Braid client implementations can talk to Redwood, which I'd love to see. But Yes, please. Let's work on that. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> Absolutely. Then cool. I can stop All maintaining right. my, my very poorly written JavaScript library. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to test it and iron out any bugs if there are any um, as well. You can. Cool. Um, that's me. Uh, so the next demo in our list we're going to go in order is Mike showing um, talking about the Braidify release and the, sorry, yeah, and the and the Braid.js one repo. You're you muted, did. Mike. There. Okay. Cool. So. Um, I'm going to let that be a demo of Braidify too. So you, you just saw it working and synchronizing. Um, but I want to show you this, uh, this mono repo. So I reorganized Braid.js. There was some confusion about what this repo even was before. And so the idea now, uh, this is a mono repo for all of our JavaScript code, or um, this, is, this is not my code. This is our code. You can add stuff into here. And um, I might add stuff into here, even if you don't, um, because it creates a common place for versioning. So if we want to make a change to the protocol, for instance, and that change would be a breaking change, then we can try implementing it in the libraries and the applications that all use it. And then we could even submit that as a, you know, you can see what all those diffs are together. And so it let us uh, change multiple things together. If you want to make a breaking change um, with, and everyone has separate repositories, you don't have control over them, then it's like, oh, I don't want to change my API or I want to, don't want to change the protocol because how would I support everyone else? This way we can make changes and implement the change everywhere else. And so you can think of it as a bit of an experiment. I know this isn't the common culture of programming these days where we separate things by different, every repo has its own NPM package. Um, but I think there'd be some interesting advantages. And also I'm generally interested in finding ways for us to just collaborate more on our code it's hard doing remote development where we're not in the same place together. And so I'm trying to just create facilities where more and more of our activities are close together. And if our code is just like a directory apart instead of a git clone, npm install apart with different permissions, then maybe it'll be easier to reuse code, for instance. Um, like one thing I put in this util folder, um, the, this apply patch function that doesn't live in any project that I've released, but it seems, you know, we had a couple of people on Discord asking, how do I just apply a patch to a JSON object? Um, so I put it in here, um, commented up a little bit. And um, so I'd love to try, try this new style of programming. Um, and then one of the things in here is Braidify. And so this is a folder, Braid.js slash Braidify. So within the Braid.js repo, you've got a bunch of director, top level directories. Each of these you could think of as a different project. And so feel free just to add your own project in here. Um, in the top level directory, you can add a readme to explain what it is. You can add your own package.json so that you can publish to NPM from here. And, um, and you can say, here's how to contribute. So I just wrote a little note saying, this is my design philosophy. And then I'm, I'm very interested in making everything work for you. <laughs> Trying to say that this is very open. This project's very open, open to your, your style. If you prefer TypeScript, I'd be happy to see if we can rewrite in TypeScript, whatever. Um, and um, the Braidify library itself is now, um, I consider this to be in beta. So it's, it's got an NPM package, you can install it. Um, there are probably gonna be a few changes to the API uh, based on feedback that I got two weeks ago that I haven't finished implementing. So, um, but it's gonna be roughly similar, like and then is probably gonna change to a different word because nobody seemed to like that word. Um, and we'll probably also add a few extra functions to, so that you can use it in different, more flexible ways without 
Um, you know, some people just had different ideas of APIs that they might prefer. So I'm going to try to add in a few more flexible ways to do that. Um, I might, it might be nice to break apart the parsing code from the API wrappers so that if you just want, because that parsing code is really general and that's like, the, so that, that's how you speak HTTP or the braid HTTP. But then there's these API wrappers that implement that inside of fetch or inside of nodes require HTTP or something like that. So that might be a nice refactoring to make. And um, I think we might also want to add a little WebSocket version. And so those are some things I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, but generally I consider this to be beta. I'd love to get feedback. I just want this to, it's such common infrastructure. I just want it to meet everyone's needs. So I just want to get as much feedback as I can. Um, and that's it for me on Braidify and Braid.js. Do you have time for a, a small uh, feature request? Yeah. Um, I, I've been using uh, Braidify a lot now, and I noticed that um, the fetch API is cumbersome in that you always, almost always have to say subscribe, keep alive, and all that stuff. And yeah. I always forget, like, is it an underscore or is it, you know, like, I, I wish that there was just a function, like, just subscribe on this URL, you know, because it's so, it's like exactly what I want to do almost all the time. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I want that too. Um, I've considered making a default mode for fetch where you say that by default, we're going to have it subscribe. And then you can just call fetch with the URL. And that's all you need. And it kind of makes sense. And maybe it's a nicer version of fetch, but it also maybe goes against the, you know, it's a little less backwards compatible. I don't know if anyone has reactions to that or if you just want a different function. Um, my preference is still just a different function that just does subscriptions rather than does fetching. So yeah, for the braid protocol library, I've got a subscribe method and you call that with URL and then it gives you back a, um, an iterable, which I prefer the API of. Um, the other thing with this as well is that this actually isn't compatible with the current fetch implementation. Um, for fetch, it should be fetch URL comma object headers colon subscribe colon keep alive. Sure, I think. Well, um, it is compatible. I mean, you can do that is version it? too. Yeah, these are just uh, short. This is the idea here is a shortcut. So, okay. All right. but that is a design question too. Should we have any shortcuts like this? So yeah, there's this, yeah. this is a like, like when we're using fetch now, the default way that we're gonna use it, it's almost always gonna be a subscription. Whereas the default for fetch in the past is different. So, you know, do we wanna add in those shortcuts to kind of change the default behavior or do we just wanna like go with the existing design mentality. And so that's, that's the tension I'm trying to play with here. Okay. And so sure. I appreciate getting, getting your input on those things. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I like the general uh, direction of this repo. It's, it's uh, cleaner, it's easier to read and um, now open. So that's nice. Yeah. Um, actually, I've got one other quick question uh, that I we do need to move on just for time. But um, if I put my Braid protocol code inside this repo, should it be at the top level a bunch more directories? Because I've split my code out into like the client, the server, the high level version of the server, the CLI and so on. Um, so should they all be like a bunch more top level directories or should that all be like encapsulated in one directory? You know, that's a, I think that's a design decision. The way that it, I've been thinking about this is that each project has a top level directory. So if you okay. consider each of these being part of the same project, which is probably different than a package. You could have packages within a project. Okay, sure thing. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, cool. Um, great. So according to the schedule, next is Santi, who talked about demoing stuff, but is not here. So um, so let's move on. So Greg, you've got um, an auto merge compatibility demo and shelf. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you, Greg. You're not muted, but we can't hear you anyway. Testing, testing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't so lucky with the uh, the sound. Can you guys hear some sort of like construction background noise, or can you hear me okay? It's fine. It's not it's too fine. bad. Yeah. Sounds like background music. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, we'll try to fiddle with the fonts here in a moment, but uh, to give some some context, uh, let's see. All right. Sorry. 
I'm moving a window that I don't think you guys can even see. It has all of your screens on it. OK, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Um, OK. What's going on? Uh, down here, you can see some, uh, some text, and this text is the same. Uh, on the left-hand side is one client that's being simulated. On the right-hand side is another client that's being simulated. And both of them have an auto merge object. And they are synchronizing that auto merge object uh, with each other. And these are the messages that they're sending. I'm going to run this code again so you can kind of see it run. So they both had some message here. I wish I could pause it. It's going to wait some time and then do some more stuff. Um, anyway, one person had typed SS, and the other person had typed uh, D, 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 D. And those messages, there's arrows here. I don't know if you can see the arrows. Um, those messages got to each other. Now, the messages themselves are uh, braid messages. I'll go over them briefly, although these are sort of uh, standard. And we've <laughs> um, these are, in fact, using the Braidify library that we've all been talking about uh, recently. Um, anyway, they have a version, parents, uh, and then these these patches. And really, these uh, these messages are kind of they're all sitting in the same stream. This kind of makes it sound like they're separate. Uh, anyway, um, up here is a, a, a kind of explanation of what's going on in terms of mapping between auto merge and braid. So over here, we have auto merge, although you might think of that as being where we start if we're going to take an auto merge message and, and send it over braid to the other person. Uh, auto merge. Uh, the language of auto merge is that uh, anytime the user changes the document, it is part of a change, and that change contains within it ops. And here are the ops here. Um, now, the change has an actor who made the change, and it has a sequence number uh, that just keeps incrementing. And the performance branch of auto merge, with this, which this is, um, kind of encapsulates that information in a hash as well. Um, in any case, this is mapped to, you might say, on the braid side, this version where we are um, putting <laughs> the actor and the sequence into a single, in the way that AutoMerge does. AutoMerge uses this, you can see it over here, this style of uh, having a sequence number and then the at symbol and then the actor ID. Um, and so we are taking uh, the actor ID and the sequence number, and we're putting them into the version. Uh, now, the dependencies variable on the automerge side um, speaks the language of these hashes. Um, but under the hoods, it is true uh, that you can search inside of automerge itself, and you can find associated with each of these hashes, you can find an actor in sequence number, because each of those hashes represents a change, and every change has an actor and sequence number, and all of those are globally unique. And so on the braid side, uh, we map each of those uh, dependencies to a, um, a sequence actor pair. Um, now we have some, some stuff that's not really used by either side. Like, so AutoMerge has a time and a message uh, which is kind of like the message on a commit message in Git. Uh, and we're just ignoring that. We're, we're it's, sorry, <laughs> that doesn't, um, this is uh, speaking mostly auto merge, but it's sacrificing those bits of information. Um, now we get to the, uh, the ops, which on the braid side is the patches. We have this, um, this path here, this JSON path with a, um, you know, in this case, this particular edit. Um, you can think of this edit, I made this edit, um, you can think of there as being uh, the, the, the sentence A, B, and we're going to replace the B, which starts at position one, which is between the A and the B, ends at position two, which is after the B. We're going to replace that B with C, C, uh, which you can see here. And we're going to do the same thing on the automerge side and how that is done over there is um, 
this is this is split apart into uh, three different actions. One action is going to delete the B, which is this delete over here. And then we have uh, two inserts to insert the, the Cs. In any case, uh, so that's the mapping between the, the language uh, of this. Now, there's some things in here that you might notice uh, that we don't send, and it might be mysterious how we can duplicate them, uh, namely these element IDs. Like this over here, we have offsets, and over here we have element IDs, and there's no direct <laughs> translation from offsets to element IDs. Um, but what this code is doing over here um, is when it receives an edit from or when it receives a braid message, it applies that edit locally into auto merge um, as if as if the remote client was local and we were just making their edit with that actor ID with the remote actor ID on our on a, a fake or a, a temporary auto merge object that, that we create that has only the state that was known about at the time that these uh, dependencies um, specify, um, applying the edit, and then asking auto merge itself what these element IDs should be in order to put it into auto merge. Um, and just to, that's in the that's in the code here somewhere. Let's see where it is. There's um, yeah, so here we're, we're doing a braid fetch. Um, I, incidentally, I second, I, I would, even if there, even if there is a, a fetch API, I would love just a, a method that is, that has two parameters, that is a URL and a callback, um, as a utility function, at least. Anyway, um, this callback is being called every time there's a new version coming from Braid. And this code, uh, what it's doing at the, at the end of the day, you can see here that it's, um, it's doing this crazy, this is, this is where the meat happens, where it takes the, um, this doc, it's, it's getting the history from AutoMerge, it's filtering it to find only the changes in the history that are um, that we care about for this change. And then we merge those all together using the actor ID that's incoming that we stole from the version itself, which we split apart based on that at symbol. And once we have that document, which is the auto merge document minus any newer versions than this incoming edit knows about. Then we do, uh, this is the regular old auto merge API for doing a change, which is that you, uh, you give it your document, it gives you a callback and you, you execute your change inside of the callback. And then it will give you back a document that is an auto merge document that has this change. And we just parse the, the patch itself and apply the edits in auto merge language, which is going to be some number of uh, deletes, um, you know, for all the for the range. Um, this is really cool. You got two more minutes. Uh, great. Um, and we insert uh, everything. It's not quite one of a time. They have a they have a utility for it. You can see that we're spreading the parameters for the patch content is ultimately going to be the, the text itself that's being inserted this spread is gonna insert each of those letters uh, one at a time. Anyway, um, and that's it. Um, I have a very small amount of time left. I'm gonna give you, you a, a glimpse of, of this crazy other thing that I've uh, been working on that um, really you can see on the side here, this, this is the data structure. This, this is, this is a data structure. It's a, um, it supports 
maps, like a hash maps, JavaScript objects, key value pairs. Um, it also supports uh, numbers and strings. And the idea is just that every, every element has a version. And it has a, um, the, merge, the merging philosophy is that if two people have an object and they both, um, let's say there's a common object, there's a, I have a, I create an object at key A um, that has some key B and somebody else creates an object at key A that has a different key, it will seamlessly merge those together. It won't assume that they're different objects. Um, no, it's, I'm running out of time. It's not a, a great explanation of that. Um, in any case, uh, at the end of the day, the um, the overhead is that you have one version per element, so it's basically you know twice as much as it. And but but the overhead never, well, it increases for deleting things, uh, which you put null. Null is a special character in this thing, um, but you can prune away the deleted things um, in a. The objects themselves have a version, and anything that's before that version is sort of assumed because that's when the the object was created. So anything before that you can assume is um, is gone. I'm this is really stop. cool. Um, we, yeah, <laughs> we we do need to move on. Uh, I'd love to see like this talked about independently of all of the other stuff. Like the stuff you were just showing before. It's I don't know. It looks really awesome, and I'd love to. Um, I uh, yeah, I'd be keen. I don't know if you've you're on the auto merge Slack, but it'd be great to show this to Martin and have a chat with him about how this is all going. Um, I think he'd love to see it too. Yeah, let's plan cool. another meeting for, I think, both of these demos and go through them in more detail. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I'm trying to stop the share, but it won't. All right, there we go. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't want to rush you. This stuff's actually really awesome. Um, I, know, also... I, I, I value the, I didn't want to go over time. I was trying to, you should. Yeah. You should cut me off. I'm, I respect the time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and also, I respect the work that you've been doing. This is like really sweet stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, Brent. Uh, Demo Redwood? Uh, I'm pushing mine to the meeting in between this and the next one. The one oh, about okay. coding on Brave. Yeah. Sure thing. Um, and then our last demo is Dwayne. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited to share <clears throat> updates to Ribbon since uh, I think the last time I demoed was about four weeks, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So um, let me share my screen here. Okay. Uh, is that looking good for everyone? People can see? Okay, cool. So um, I have two servers set up. Um, one is at files.land and the other is canadadwain.com. And each of these ribbon applications um, has two, uh, two authors on each server. So there's a default author and a friend author. You can also create a custom URL, but I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but that would be something like uh, I have my stuff hosted on some other server and I want this application to show it for some reason. But I don't think that's relevant here. So um, we can see that uh, if I go to my posts right now, I am the default user. So I'm seeing four posts here on canadaduane.com. If I switch to um, friend, this would be like, you know, a login that we're simulating here. Um, then I go here and my posts are different. So these are, uh, these are a separate list of posts. Now, right now, um, if, okay, if I go to my likes, so this is actually the friend's likes, the friend likes its own posts. So that's why the friends posts end up in the friends feed. Uh, so by default, um, each of the uh, feeds are subscribed to their own posts because they like themselves. Now um, you can add a like, actually I'm gonna switch back to the default view here. So we have our uh, default users posts. And if I go in here and I say, um, let's like, uh, author friend post zero. If I come back to my, my posts will still be the same, but my feed will now have a, an additional element here. So I've, I've got all of the posts that I created because I like my own posts. And now I have a single entry from a post that somebody else has written. Um, so uh, 
I can come over to this other blog and I can say, I want to like a feed. So I could say, let's, I want to, I want to like everything that's in Canada Dwayne's feed. So author default feed. And now um, I've liked my own posts and I've liked Canada Dwayne's feed and I can, uh, is it going to mess up? Did I enter it incorrectly? Oh, I did. I forgot the Canada Dwayne.com. Okay. So let's try this again. Dot com for 3000 author default feed. So now if I go back here, I get all of the feeds that um, Dwayne has liked, including the uh, entry that was liked of the friend. So this is basically like a, a distributed recursive um, aggregator happening here. So everything is subscribing and it's like a DAG that's coming up to my feed. Um, if that makes sense. So we could go, we could go here to uh, files.land friend and this view will still be just its own posts. But if I were to like, uh, I guess I could like, let's see if this works. <laughs> I haven't tried this yet. Uh, 3030 author default feed. Okay, let's see what this feed, okay, there we go. So now we like everything. Um, I think the, the next steps will probably be, um, well, we can start experimenting with this because it's like, it's all live data, right? So we could, we could use this for messaging, we could use it for microblog, um, we could try uh, blog posts. There's a whole bunch of things that we can uh, try from here on out. This is using Bradify. And uh, um, one of the things that has changed since the last time that's I think kind of interesting, I didn't really think about it when I first, so the first version of the app tried to aggregate on the client side. Um, but the problem with that is that if you aggregate on the client side, then you can't let other people subscribe to your aggregated view of things. So in this view, um, all the server, all of the linking and, and aggregating is going on on the server side so that clients can just keep tapping into whatever, um, whatever thing is, um, whatever feed is being published and republished and so on. Any questions? I think that's about all I, I was gonna show. Can we use this now? Yeah, yeah we can use this. Can it doesn't I have logins. So pretty insecure. And it also doesn't save things on the hard drive. So it would lose it if it kills the server. Okay, that's fine with me. Uh, can I can I like go to, can I make, can I go to files.land? What would I do to start using it? Would I use one of these existing um, servers or should I run it on my own? Either one. Uh, yeah, I, I, all of the code on um, braid, braid-org slash ribbon is, um, is updated. So, um, I think, uh, Mike, you and I tried this a couple of, maybe four days ago, we tried getting it to run, but at that time I wasn't using the latest Bradify, or I think we were still working on Bradify's uh, new version. So um, it should work now. You should be able to just install it. Okay. Um, and I just, so I just opened up files.land 3030 in a browser. Okay. Um, is there a way I'm on that default user thing? Can I create my own user here? without permissions or does it have to be, is that hard coded in or something? It's currently hard coded. Yeah, I don't have um, authors being created uh, dynamically. There's also a strange bug that um, I'm kind of curious if anyone else has run into this. Um, in Firefox, I'm getting a limited number of, uh, a limited number of subscriptions allowed yeah. even on HTTP2. Oh, on two. No. Interesting. Well, let's look into that. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't 100% identified that, that that's the cause, but it seems like it is. So I'm, uh, yeah, so, sort of some, a few caveats that I've run into here and there, so. It's great that you run into, the, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> uh, we need to fix those things that it was coming up. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if you want to install it, it's uh, it's at GitHub grid or ribbon. Good stuff. 
Cool. Well, I want to start using it. Yeah, I'm going to start sending you messages. And I'd love to be able to create an account, like have a shared server so that we could yeah. all just make some accounts on it and start talking to each other with little fuss. And I think also making it easy to install our own instances is great too. And then we can tweak the code. I like it. Yeah, we can uh, definitely add dynamic authors. Um, we should probably talk about whether we care enough about signing in so that people can't like, screw around with each other's stuff, but I'm okay with it open for now. Um, is it like, so if I follow all of your stuff, Dwayne, and then you follow all of my stuff and then Mike follows all of Greg's stuff, like, is there any <laughs> limit to the depth of recursion? Like, is there a way I can say just, you know, yeah, so that's a really good point. This doesn't, um, this doesn't trace cyclic, uh, subscriptions. So there will be at some point you just like kill the server. Um, <laughs> uh, how we resolve that, I think I think we need to like sort of figure that out because it, it's yeah. somewhat hidden to each to each hop um, what it's subscribing to. But I think we can. I think it has yeah. enough information with the uh, resource IDs that it can figure it out. Because there's the recursive problem. Uh, sorry, there's the cyclical problem, and there's also just like too much content at some point, right? Like, sure, I like your stuff, Dwayne, but I don't like all the things that you like. Like, I don't know. I just want to read your blog posts. Um, yes. There's something, uh, it might be worth stealing an idea from Scuttlebutt when they have, yeah, they've got an idea of depth. So, you oh, know, yeah. I say like, here's some things that I like and then fetch me like one hop away from all of those things. So, um, mm. you know, so then if you're talking to somebody else and going back and forth, I'll see their messages as well because they're one hop away from you, mm. but I won't see like the things that they follow in turn um, unless I well, explicitly follow them. One thing we do have that sort of halfway there is you can just subscribe to the posts of an author instead of to their feed. So right. Okay. Uh, you would get to see the person that you like, um, but you wouldn't get to see one hop away from them. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I agree that what you're saying is, is, uh, it's kind of a nice compromise. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess maybe like if we're actually practically using it, that might be a way that we do it just following someone's posts, but yeah, it's really sweet though. Thanks. <laughs> I feel like, we're going to get some pull requests from Mike in the next week or two, uh, <laughs> chopping at the bit to do some stuff with it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited to try. Um, cool. Well, are there any other questions? I'd like really? to like bridge with it. Yeah, yeah, Angela, I was thinking about you. So I think I'm at the point now where I can start using um, more canonical schema stuff. So um, using MF2, uh, you know, that kind of publishing standard. Um, I'm not creating any HTML pages at this point. I mean, they're just compiled, they're pre-compiled, you know, static pages. But um, I think for MF2 to work, I probably need to dynamically generate HTML, right? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna point to the wiki page. I just updated the, uh, well, a couple days ago, I updated the meeting dash six, the, the agenda page okay. to include some micro formats in there. And then I went to go, you know, use it. And I realized that the HTML wasn't there. So yeah, it might be a good, good time to get your feet wet with like incorporating that. I don't know. It, it might be irrelevant to braid, but it also might be turn off to those that are yeah i think I, in my view it's like why not like it, it just it, it's it's almost free like you just add an html page and suddenly you're compatible with like a huge swath of of uh indie indie web right so why not even if it falls out of date it's like low the low lo-fi uh fallback um, yeah right right that's a good point too i think we're kind of talking about with like snapshot updates and things like that that those can sort of fulfill similar purpose and yeah. But either way, I wanna definitely be subscribing to all of your feeds if you guys are emitting there and uh, I'm, I'm ready for that. <laughs> and vice versa. That's awesome. Yeah, actually it'd be also pretty sweet just to take my blog on josephg.com and then have a subscription feed. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be awesome. Um, I've, I've added some micro formats a few years ago to that, but like, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I'm still just posting on my blog, but then you guys can still subscribe. It's sweet. Awesome. 
Cool. Um, so let's move on. Uh, so the last thing that I want to go through is go through some um, some of the issues that are outstanding on Braid. So, uh, so this is this is the um, O3 milestone. Um, so <laughs> I would like to close some of these issues if we can, um, and I'd like to use at least you know maybe like half an hour of our remaining time to have some chat since someone after that. Um, so this is the list uh, I haven't gone through and. Um, uh, Mark to add any more issues to this, but this is a, a the set that Mike's added the um, the milestone 03 to. Uh, Mike, do you want to run us through these, or um, or shall I? I might either way. Yeah, why don't you take us through? I I I'm not sure which ones we want to look at first here. Or does anybody okay. have any? Has anyone looked at these? And is anything jumping out? The first one should oh, be just, pretty easy, I think. So the ones yeah, that the are jumping out to easy. me are the ones that say "discuss at meeting." <laughs> oh okay. yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, we added those tags uh, a few week meetings ago. I'm gonna go. Oh. Dwayne's suggestion to go for the first one first. I, I want to talk about this patches okay one, um, but yeah, we can like I don't know, make this scatter shot. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think that one has a pull request. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we just need to like review the pull request and see if all the text looks good. Um, All right. So this is from the 9th of February. So assuming that we're happy with this pull request, um, is everyone happy with this, merging this? Yeah, I think um, my, uh, so just so that everybody knows, like the HTTP spec is weird because it actually asks the request to have a range header and the format should not have a space between it and its value. So just on space, or byte space number. And then the response is supposed to have content dash range with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. So range is supposed to have the equal sign. Content dash range is supposed to have a space when it um, responds. So it's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing that we're, I guess, keeping from the HTTP spec. I think that this might be superseded in part by the patch range. Um, I, I suppose if we use patch dash range, we can do whatever we want and then standardize on the request and response. But I think if, as long as we're sort of riffing off of HTTP, then we're supposed to do what they do. That makes sense to me. Um, do we want to be moving towards patch dash range? Is that a, is that a thing? I haven't seen anyone. I like it a lot. Uh, I think that's my, my idea is we will figure that out for draft of four and then. Okay. You know. All right, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so from that perspective, then are we happy for, um, <laughs> I've seen people say this, but like, uh, like disposition merge, unless anyone's got any other comments. I guess we could say, uh, like, does anybody have any reason to not merge this right now? Or would anyone like some time to review it? <laughs> sounds sounds like we can go for it. Yeah. Great. All right. It doesn't seem worse than what was there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's pretty minor. Uh, beautiful. Uh, this is now a work meeting. We actually did work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's hard clicking the button. <laughs> Great. Nice. Uh, cool. Um, uh, I'm going to go jump to this one next because it's been sticking out for me. Uh, so there's there's a bunch of uh, a patches OK header in the spec right now. Um, I don't think anyone knows what it means, even Mike, who wrote it. Uh, so um, Mike, do you want to you want to introduce this or talk about it? Um, yeah. So this, uh, I think that the the idea here is for the server to signal if it can speak patches and probably which type of patches. And I think that probably someone, maybe me, was thinking about this at the last minute before the deadline, like, hey, maybe we need some way of specifying this and added a little patches okay header into, um, into resources that can appear generally in responses to tell you that it's accepting patches. Um, there are a couple okay. other issues then later that Bryn uh, or not Bryn, uh, I think Mitar suggested 
Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom here, um, there's probably some other GitHub issues. Uh, there, number 49. Yeah, so then, so Mitar is saying we, we could have an accept range patch header. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also noticed that there was in HTTP already, there is uh, in the specification for patch, I think there is some kind of header already for accepting patches that we could be reusing for this purpose. Um, so there are a few different models of how a server could signal what types of patches it is accepting. And I think mm -hmm. we need to review them and, and then figure out which model we want to have here. Clarifying yeah, that question. Sounds, that makes sense to me. Um, is this is this um, something like the server needs to be able to say which of the patches was accepted, or is it sort of all or nothing? Uh, I think the main purpose is for the server to say what types of patches it speaks. Okay. Not, so it's a capability, not yeah. a oh. uh, not yeah. a response successor. Yeah, the response uh, oh, successor okay. failure is the status code. But my understanding is that- Sorry, I was imagining. Yeah, so you, you might think of the capabilities as being in an options or a head request. I think that my understanding, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is true, but my understanding is that um, this such capabilities could go in any response, not, not just the options or head. Yeah, so Sorry, I was thinking I about this from the perspective of like, what methods, so is, does the server accept patches coming from a client, but, which is different from what it sounds like you're saying, which is, you know, this is naming whether or not you're gonna get patches in the subscription that you've connected to already, you know, because those are different things. Um, and Right, like, is the server gonna send patches to the client versus is the server receiving patches from, from clients? Yeah, I think those are both important. Those both seem like relevant questions to be asking. I don't think patches okay is distinguishing that. I mean, obviously it's not even saying what it is, but I don't know if we need yeah. to separate. Yeah. yeah, do we need to, I think maybe what we need to do um, here is figure out what all the different things are that we need to communicate and express, and then also look at all of the relevant existing headers for this purpose. Yep. Um... Uh, 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 patches going to be sent in subscriptions. Um, so, all the types. Right. Um, so, it's something like this. All right. So, my preference for now to get O3 uh, out is I think we should remove this header from the examples and then loop back in milestone 04 and, um, and actually figure this stuff out. Um, the other option would be to figure all this out before we launch 04, uh, 03 and replace this header with something that makes sense. That sounds good to me. Yeah, so we could remove all patch capabilities from 03 and then figure it out for 04. Yeah. Cool, so uh, we can throw together a pull request and match that um, soon. Great. Um, uh, yeah, did everyone know, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry, does anyone else have any comments on that? I'm, I'm in favor of punting <laughs> as a meta strategy without <laughs> this. Um, so that's this in a regional place. Uh, is anyone, are any of these other issues crying out for anybody? Or we can just go through a few of them from top to bottom. Removing separation from HTTP get response and first version. That one's kind of interesting. Uh, do you want to introduce it? So, sure. So um, is there an example here? Is this a pull request or is this, yeah. Let's look at the pull request. There we go. There's, there's the diff. Um, so. <laughs> So the idea here is that the in um, so a braid subscription 
if you sub do a get subscribe, it's going to return you a sequence of versions that are all separated by a blank line. Mm -hmm. The first thing that it returns you is probably going to be the first version and like the initial version. And if you just did a regular get request, that could look the same as the initial version without a blank line because the response of the get request is just going to be the version. So I think the intuition here is, hmm, maybe the first version should not have a blank line before it. And then the entire response could look identical up until the point where new versions come in afterwards. Uh, I think if we look in the conversation, I think we had some questions about whether that actually works. No, we don't. It's on, um, it's on the uh, ticket. It's this year. Okay. Yeah. Sarah. Or, so we've got. Is it six? Yeah, it must be that one. I think. Oh, no, no. That's, that's a different one. That's. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of these issues are duplicated because we have the issue and then the pull request. Yeah. That, that's a pull request. It's got that little icon to the left. So we need the. Um, does it, did I not reference it in the pull request? I usually do that, but I may not have in this case. Oh, it's the first issue on the, the issue. Oh, there it is. Remove separation between. Oh. Our, that, yeah. Yeah. That. First version. Is it this one? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my concern with this is that it makes the service more complicated. Oh, we talked about it last time too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's going to make the server and client more complicated because it means that the first first response is special. Um, so like the pausing state is going to start in a weird place because it's going to have to pause after the headers of the first update from the first response. Um, I, I was having the same thought, but then I had the thought, is it, would it really have to change the parsing state? Because the stuff that's above the version thing are just more headers. And so it seems like maybe you could write the same loop that would. Yeah, the but these headers, these headers usually get paused by the HTTP client library or the HTTP server library. So like, that's fair. You're not actually pausing these. Um, mind you, I mean, like it's, it's pretty doable. It's not like it like adds a bit of complexity, but it's not a lot. No, I agree, and I, I just um, one. You're right. The the libraries themselves often parse the actual headers. Yeah, so one of the use cases that kind of um, inspired this thought was I was using Postman uh, for kind of inspecting requests back and forth, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if this were already embedded in a tool I already use, so I don't have to change the tool that I use. I can just make a request and um, see a response. That would be really nice. <laughs> and in fact, one of the things that's a little bit tricky with, uh, with using Postman is the content length of the, uh, of the response. Yeah, so I was just about to say, I actually don't, I don't think we can put this content length header at the top level because if like this, this header has a special meaning in the HTTP headers, which means that after you've read this many bytes on the stream, then this mm. HTTP response is over and you know, the connection we reused. Oh, that's a good point. And we're also returning a different status code. And so I don't know if Postman will be okay mm. with the 209 status code. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point with the content. Like I was hoping that I could just get it to calculate it for me, but now you've pointed out that that's incompatible. So I think that's a, that's a no-go. Yeah, and we could test I it. mean, if, well, <laughs> I don't think we need to, I can tell you what it does. Like it, that's the HTTP 1.1 to eight, sorry, HTTP 1.0 to 1.1 difference that in 1.1, you can reuse connections to reuse a connection. Um, every connection needs to specify uh, when the connection, sorry, when the request and response is over so that the connection can be reused. And then to do that, you must have either a content length header or a uh, transfer encoding specified that can notify when the connection's over. And so. Well, um, do you know if that is true for 209 response codes and not just 200 response well, codes? 209 doesn't exist in the HTTP lexicon yet. So um, most clients and servers will just go off, you know, 
and I'd be like, ah, I don't know what that status code means. I'll just assume that means something sensible. No, that's not that's not a two hundred thing. That's an every response thing. Like that's true of four hundred threes, and it's true of you know, um, yeah, like redirects and everything else, like three hundred fours and so on. That they always have content length for the body length. I think what we're saying is that if we have both a content length and a uh, transfer encoding chunked, this, that's not allowed, right? I think that's not allowed. I mean, yeah, we could test it out. Um, like, I, I like it as an idea. And like, another approach would be to change the name of content length to be instead um, update length, version length, something like that, uh, in which case it would be fine. Hmm, that's a good point. Yeah, this, this feels to me like something that it, uh, the idea here is to make additional compatibility in some clever ways. Mm -hmm. And by kind of slipping in how different existing clients are implementing the protocol. And sometimes we can't tell that from reading the spec and sometimes you just have to like test it out with a few things and then kind of tweak and go. So I think that if we wanna get this in for Braid 03, probably what we need to do is do that tweaking and experimentation and see if we can find something. But we might just need some experimental results to know that we can move forward on a clever design like this. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so one thing, my, go for it, uh, One thing about changing it to something like uh, update length, um, in my particular use case, Postman wouldn't know what to do with that and I would still have to manually calculate it. So it's not a big win, um, but it's, I guess it's possible <laughs> instead of impossible with the, the other scenario. Can, can you help me understand also the use case for Postman? Is it that you wanna, like you're writing some a server and then you wanna see that you're returning the right kind of response at all, even though, cause Postman can't understand the subscription, right? So would yeah. be able to see the first version and be able to get some mileage out of that? Yeah, exactly. Debugging. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like maybe I could just say, say, try this version and then I get a version, but ignore all the rest of the subscription. Cool. Yeah. So okay. my, my preference on the way to move forward with this, uh, I think we've got two options. One of them is to do a bunch of experimentation and do all of that and figure out whether or not we want this before 03. The other option would be to punt it to 04. Um, and that's my preference, just because I think if we're going to do this, it might also look like changing the word content link to something else. Um, and if we change content link, we might also need to change content type, because we're currently using the word content type both to refer to the type of patches and also to refer to the type of the content itself. Um, I, I don't know if that's if that matters. I guess I guess it's like this makes sense when we're sending a, a snapshot update not when we're sending patches as the first response at the moment. Um, actually, maybe that one's fine, but yeah. Well, another way to put this is that um, we, we've now brought up some ways to make this work that require changes to some of these headers that we're already thinking about revisiting in 04. And it's yeah. going to be hard to make those de decisions in isolation, and so it makes sense to punt it. Okay. Yeah, I think so right. too. Um, for what it's worth, I'm also in favor of punting it. <laughs> I like your design philosophy, Greg. <laughs> Not a few words, but the same opinion. Um, last one. Can I, can I remove it from the master? Perfect. Great. Um, uh, this is easy. This is an easy thing. Um, so this is Oh yeah, this is pretty small and I'm pretty sure we should be able to merge this. Um, this is saying that uh, there's some, right now the spec implies that, yeah, this is just a wording change. Um, so my read of the spec is that if you do a version request, like you specify historical versions from the server, um, that the server can say, like has to either 
honor that request or not honor it entirely. Um, there's a, a HTTP error code, which is range not satisfiable to specify that the range isn't satisfiable. And um, I wanted to add some text to be clear about what that error should look like if the server doesn't um, doesn't accept the, they can't satisfy the range of um, historical versions you requested. So this is just a simple text change for that. So um, the range, um, my my understanding is that this is talking about the range, like uh, like an arrange request. Are you, is that what you mean here? Are you, it, it seems like you're talking about a range of time, like a range of history. I am talking about a range of time. Yeah. And the question is, and this is like a general problem that the spec's got at the moment that we've got, we have nowhere near enough description of what all the error codes are if things go wrong. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong throughout the spec and I have no idea what error codes the server should send. So we do need to start specifying that. Range not satisfiable is used for range requests, but also requesting historical versions is kind of a range request in its own way. Um, the other option would be like 404 or something like the, you know, the content, the ranges that are requested aren't found. I'm not sure if 404 is more descriptive though. Well, I think 404, I see what you mean. The resource doesn't exist. We could we could have a, um, a new status code too for that those versions in time don't exist. Yeah, talking to M not, he said that adding new status codes to HTTP is like very difficult to get that through the standards committee now. Um, so I think if we can reuse something that'd be better. The other nice thing about 406, uh, 416 is that there's also a header that goes along with this if we want to use it, which is like, and here's the actual part of the range that's not specified and not satisfiable. So if we want to, we can say like in the response, range wasn't satisfiable and the particular part of the historical, you know, uh, history that's not available is, is like from here to here. Yeah, I'd want to have some certainty that because, uh, the, you know, the, like it might be kind of strange for like the range means that there is a range request. Like then there is like a range header in the get. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be concerned that there might be something that could go wrong if you don't have a range request. There's no range in the header of the request and then it's telling you the range isn't satisfiable. That seems, I don't know if that would cause any problems anywhere. You know? Well, I think that would cause less problems than for foring. Because the from the perspective of a cache, it would look like a request for a resource and then the response being a 404. And then it would throw out its cached copy of that resource, even though the HTTP request was actually just asking for the historical ranges. Like I'm actually not entirely sure what we should do about things like that in general. I okay, here's an argument for having a separate error code too. Um, I think that this does seem like a fairly like it could be a common case where you have a client that's reconnecting and is trying to reconnect from some old version and it wants to know, okay, if I can't do this, then I want to do something special, you know? And then you want to know that differently than like, if the resource doesn't exist anymore, you get a 404, then you're like, okay, yeah, something is really screwed up. But if it's just that the, that those uh, historical versions don't exist, then specifically what I'm going to want to do as a client is maybe try to rebase my edit somehow and guess how they go in, reload the raw data from the server and try to reapply them or just obliterate my edits and reload the data from the server. And it seems yeah. like so, knowing that that specific case is happening could be really valuable. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, I don't think we should get into it in too much detail now. It sounds like you wanna make a counter proposal of uh, inventing a new status code for this particular kind of error. Yeah. There is also 425 too early. And I know it's sort of a bit too clever, but maybe it may work in, in a case like this. Can you, can you, what's for, <laughs> can you explain the cleverness? I don't get it. I don't know. I was just going through the list of HTTP status codes. It's like, it's Mark experimental, but it says too early. Indicates that the server is unwilling to risk processing a request that might be replayed, which creates potential for replay attack. So it's not really, not, our case, but I think it may be close to uh, see the version not being available. Yeah, that feels more obscure than using 416 to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, get like, around Mike's, Mike's it sounds like we have there's there's a meta conversation around um, should we or can we add uh, response codes, right? 
If the answer to that is yes, then we might want to consider a special case. If the answer to that is no, then really we're looking at existing 400 level error codes and what, what, which one fits best. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I'm happy to write up a counter proposal for a new status code. Am I hearable? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can hear. Okay. Um, shoot. Well, <laughs> um, I was just going to ask how how hard it is to create a new status code. Is it is it just putting it in this document, or does another document need to be you know another committee? Is it a, a separate? process that would need to be linked with this process? Or is it just uh, more words in this document saying, and by the way, we're creating a new status code? Um, so the, the process is that we have our group that we're finding some consensus on these documents. And it's easy for us to come up with a new status code. The concern is that the HTTP working group has a, um, was like, like uh, at some point, we'd like this to be an official part of HTTP. And so that means going through the HTTP working group. And the concern is that they have a higher bar for adding new status codes than for adding a new header. And so the question there is like, are we proposing something that's important enough for to warrant a new status code for the ACD working group? Yeah, it seems like what we need to, uh, that importance question seems to be related to specific use cases, right? Like, is there a case where we have a range, like, I guess the scenario where we would need a new status response is um, we made a range request and we also requested history and there was an ambiguous response uh, with that 416. Did the 416 refer to the range request or did it refer to the history? Yeah, like the range could be satisfiable but the history isn't satisfiable. Right, so there's some ambiguity there, but the question is like, is that a practical concern, right? There may never, there may like not really be a situation where that happens. I don't know. We'd need, we'd, we'd need like specific use cases to prove that that's a problem. I think 412, uh, 412 may be a better match if you treat version header as a precondition, then 412 precondition failed would be probably an appropriate response here. I think the the sorry which four twelve. I think those preconditions might be like uh, the if match or if not match preconditions. Right, yeah, that's right. But again, if you treat the version header as a precondition, then or if version yeah. match, then I, I think modifying the header may be easier than just specifying uh, a new HTTP response code. Yeah, my, my yeah I see where you're coming from with that. I I think these yeah these are nice ideas um my, my my guess is that i think the new response code is i think it's probably going to justify or adding a fundamental new dimension to http which is time and history and that seems worthy of a status code um, but I, I also really like these other ideas and i think it's well worth fleshing them out okay um so the question is then what, what's the path forward for this particular issue do we want to like Mike, do you want to put in an alternate proposal? I feel like there there is that question. Like, M not the working group chair said that it's almost impossible to get new HTTP status codes added. So I'm, I'm like I'm actively worried about that. If we do decide to go down that road, it might make it much more difficult to standardize the like rate itself. I just had the thought that I, I can understand why they care because I guess they can only have a hundred of them. Then they <laughs> yeah done. Once they move to decimal. I think we could, um, I think it makes sense to at least have a couple proposals here. And mm -hmm. okay. then we can uh, talk to the working group at the point that that happens and flip if necessary. <laughs> so well, back can, I, can I suggest um, before we decide that, um, I, I, I kind of like that there's, there's very little downside to having braid 03 have a 416 response code, right? Like, we get something out of it. We can tell the difference between a, a version that did or did not succeed on the request. And then we might be wrong about the, the actual number, the status code itself, right? It might be, it might need to be 428 or whatever uh, we decide, but 
but the wording seems good, the, uh, the, the intent seems good, and the value is there by having some new error code differentiate two cases that we currently don't differentiate between. I'm wondering if Braid03 can accept this, and then we punt the little tiny question of, is 416 the correct status code to Braid04? So you're suggesting yeah, that we, we, we standardize on 416 and then open the question of changing it to the next one. I also mm -hmm. don't think that any of our implementations right now are rejecting based on versions. Yeah, well, I think, I think Dwayne's point is that it'll allow the, um, the document to make this distinction. Not that it'll allow the code, the code um, it won't break any of the code, but it'll allow the document, like people reading the document to have an idea of the spec making this distinction. And the only thing that needs to be, so people can uh, evaluate a lot of the intent of this design idea. And the only remaining bit to be hammered out is the actual number. I'm just restating Dwayne's point, I think. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I support that. And what we can do is merge this and then Mike uh, or, yeah, Mike can open a new ticket or people who care about the particular status code, we can have another discussion on that about, you know, what that should be changed to. It's um, another so option. Another option is to avoid the failure altogether. So if there is no version, just indicate that in the response and send the snapshot back. Like send a 200 okay and then have an empty body? or send the, the snapshot of the document. So if you're asking for specific version, the version is not there, send the, the current version of the document. I see. So you just send whatever you have. It seems exactly. like it, it could be accidentally, uh, accidentally very large, maybe. Yeah, and that's also kind of weird. Like, I, you know, there's no other cases where if I ask for one resource, and if it's not there, HTTP just gives me a totally different result. I'm just um, saying, I'm just trying to look at the yeah. problem from a completely different angle. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. I mean, that I, if it also, it seems like um, if the purpose here is to get something in the spec, even if we're not settled on it, um, and the purpose is so that when people are reading it, they know that there's, it's like a footholder or something. What's, what's the idea of going with the 416? Because I'm wondering if that same purpose is, is served by Paul's suggestion. The, the purpose, as I understand it, would be um, the idea is that in the end, the, the idea of writing that is that in the end, it, it is a good idea to make that distinction, to give some sort of error code indicating that you tried to grab a historical version and it wasn't there or we didn't have it. Um, like that's the, like the person reading the spec who put this pull request said, we need to make, we need an error code for this event that can happen. Um, and so they wrote this, this verbiage that says, here's the error code. Um, and, and it seems like there's a lot of agreement that it would be nice to have an error code there. And it seems like maybe, you know, maybe there's not agreement about that. And then the, the only thing that we disagree about is what the error code should be, what the four or what the three digits of it should be. And so uh, the idea would be, it'd be more than a footholder. It would be more than just like, we're going to write some stuff here. It would be all of the stuff that would be written. It'd be an entirely complete edit to the document uh, with the understanding amongst us that somebody is going to immediately make a change request for those three numbers to be something different in the next version of the document. So that we can discuss those three numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah, or, or like put it in those terms. I feel like there's two different parts forward here. One is we merge it as is and then fix it up later. And the other one is we punt on it now and then talk about it for before anyway. Um, I'd be happy with either of those approaches, uh, but either way, I would like to move on from this issue for now. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I do think, like, I, I do want to argue for a different status code. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
if we're choosing, if the idea is choosing one of those numbers, then uh, for now and then and punting on and like choosing them again later, um, then we're likely to be, it's, it's kind of like we're putting something in the spec that we know we're gonna change. So we're like gonna break compatibility on that in the next version. We also, if we don't have anyone implementing it, then there's no need to have it in the spec really, except to suggest that it might happen later, which we could do just with some language. And we could even say, here's a four XX, the exact number we're gonna determine later and mm -hmm. explain that language. And I think that would be fine too. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really mind either way. Um, I just do wanna move on to this conversation. So uh, yeah, so I'd be happy with that. Maybe I can update this, this uh, pull request to say, you may respond using an error code um the actual error code will be changed later you know it will look something like this x x x or something would be happy with that i'd be happy with that yeah great cool so uh um fast forward uh change one six to x x x and merge for a very very uh we will decide a status code Great. And Steph, I think having some context may be helpful because it's not clear to me what other options the client will have. So let's say the server says no. So what is client going to do? It's not going to give up, right? So the next step would be to request the entire document anyway, because there's no um, other option. So I think having the context may help in the in framing the discussion. Right. Yeah, you're saying this discussion itself needs more context about what the what other options or what this client might want to do. Right. Um, yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have an open question of like, I'd like to see some use cases for the server getting historical documents. Like, what, what's this, what's the client actually trying to get? from doing that. Yeah, that'd be useful too. Because um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure actually what the client wants. <laughs> um, that would help. Uh, cool. So that's, we've talked about this, we've talked about this, we've talked about this. Uh, can we go through all of them? What about client header there? Has that been discussed? Yeah, yeah that might be doable. What, did we discuss this one last time? Can someone give a summary of this? Yeah, let's see what the last comment is here. Okay, so um, I think that this one created a whole lot of discussion um, about tangential topics. The, the core idea here is if you are a client that does a subscription to the server, so say I'm subscribing to the state foo and I'm getting back mm -hmm. all updates to foo. Now, oh look, that's even what it says. So I do a get foo subscribe. <laughs> now, if I do a put to foo, should it send back that new version in the in my own subscribe request? Okay. So um, there are a couple of downsides for it sending it back. One is that it uses more bandwidth. Okay. Like I don't need to see this version that I already sent to the server. I don't need to get it twice. Um, but then the other problem is that the client then has to know that this is a version that it already created. Because usually the client, when it creates a, a change, it's gonna implement that in its own state. So like if the user's typing something, then as soon as the user hits a keystroke, that's gonna change the client state. Then it's gonna send the keystroke to the server. The server is gonna send it back to it. And if the, so if the client um, has a whole like a CRDT or is basically keeping track of versioning history and it versions each message, then it can know I already sent this message because it's version ID blah, and then I get it back. Oh, this is version ID blah. I already have version ID blah, so now I can ignore it. But if it hasn't, if it's a simple client that hasn't implemented that technology, then when it receives the edit back, it's going to think, oh, here's a new version. Let me just change my state to represent this. And if this is the user typing stuff, then it's going to see old state of the document come back at it. So one solution here is, so there's that network, network bandwidth problem. And then there's also the problem with getting echoes coming back to it. 
And so a simple solution is for the client to say, to have a random ID associated with all of its requests. And then the server can refrain from sending things back to the client that it already sent. Yep. Um, an account of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with OT, uh, it's actually critically important that the client finds out at what point in the subscription stream that their own operation was applied. So if your own operation is missing from the stream, it's not enough just to get the response back from the put request. Um, you also need to know like which version your your change ended up being applied at. So um, if in the in the subscription it's like a change from Mike, a change from Dwayne, I need to know then it was my change and this particular change was applied, and then it was a change from um, uh, from Greg. So uh, it, yeah, that's important for the client to know inside OT algorithms. You don't care about the content because um, you know what the content is, but you need to know the order um, in that stream. In OT, is the client okay with the server not sending back its own edits back to itself? No, that's not okay. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, the, uh, yeah you, 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 you're you okay with the server not sending back the content of the edit, that's fine, but the it's not okay for the server not to um, like, yeah, you need to know the timing. Um, so you need to know where your change, when your change was applied relative to the other changes from the server um, so that you know when to stop transforming things. Cool. So you Mike, need to I think Go ahead. There, may, there may be a simple solution for this. So either you track history or if you don't want to track history, just make the version specific enough. For example, add your own or origin to your own version. So when you get it back, you just need to parse the version to see if it matches the origin. So roughly like timestamp at origin, like what uh, Greg was showing yeah. earlier, for example. And if you want yeah, to be saying. client, you'll be just relying on that match. And if you want a little bit more complex client, you'll be just checking the history. So I hear what you're saying. The problem with that is that in OT, you also often don't let the clients specify the version. So the server is the only one that gets to name what the versions are for each change um, because it's not up to the client. And then, you know, it's version one, version two, version three, uh, those numbers are server assigned. So the, yeah, the client doesn't get to decide. Um, yeah, you're talking in, about in the OT. OT right? Yeah, I'm talking about OT. Yeah. yeah. So in the OT implementation I did on top of Braid protocol, I added another header. So this is a counter proposal, I guess, which I should probably add in this issue um, of mm -hmm. having the client specify a patch ID um, with the patch itself. And then the patch ID then reappears in the subscription stream so the client can identify its own changes in the subscription, right. but it's the client notice, notice, noticing its own changes. Um, the server's not removing them and not aligning them from the stream. Like I think the bandwidth aspect of it is actually pretty minimal because if you're typing alone, then it's, yeah, I mean, it's, well, yeah, if you're collaboratively editing, it's, it, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a small multiplier factor if you're seeing all of your changes in the subscription, but yeah. Yeah, my preference would be for the server not to remove that because there may be some other parts of the protocol that may be relying on that echo. And, and I understand it does seem to be wasteful a bit, uh, but I think uh, there may be ways to deal with it without modifying the protocol itself. Yeah, um, yeah. well, I'm, I'm getting the feeling now of proposing to put punt this off until later because, and the, the rationale for it is that um, you guys are bringing up that, so th this proposal is specifically about adding a, a, a header to give each client or peer some ID. It is not specifying the semantics, defining the semantics of, the, of a server, not sending back the versions for that peer. And it seems like that's actually a big question because different synchronizers will want to behave different ways with what data they're sending back to the peer. And so since that's the bigger discussion, which was the whole motivating purpose or the big part of the motivating purpose of this issue, I think it probably makes sense to just punt it for now. And any system that wants to use this mechanism can do it uh, non-standardly in the meantime. Yeah, although yeah. with that, because it's kind of related, this is just a, a thought um, I would be in favor of considering the idea of moving away from versions as, as well, moving, <laughs> having uh, actor IDs or peer IDs, you might say, and sequence numbers as just part of the, as part of braid. Um, 
anyway, just throwing that out there as an idea because having um, having actor or peer things would kind of uh, kill part of this bird um, with a stone that also helps it. And it just turns out that um, it just it just seems like uh, more information that's easier to get. Like there's no downside of doing it. Uh, you're welcome to submit an issue for that. I, I just have a yeah. clarifying question. Um, it sounds like this particular issue 72 has kind of embedded in it two proposals. One is echo back the client in the request. And the other is don't send something if it's a match. Is that is that right? Am I understanding that correctly in this issue 72? Well, echo, echoing back the client in the request, I think, is the default. So I think this is this issue 72 is saying two things, probably. One of them is don't send back the request to the initial client, uh, to the sending client. And then the other thing is give each client a way to say who they are so okay. that you can tie together the get and the put requests as being from the same client. OK, I see. So the server would then be able to do that, but it's not really related to the client seeing its own client ID back somehow. Yes. This, the, the reason, yeah. the reason I'm asking is because we want, like you were saying, the client needs to be able to ignore its own edit. But um, maybe this, I thought that adding the client header in and echoing it back would allow the client to um, ignore its own edit. But I think it's probably more complicated than that. So. Yeah, adding the client header yeah. would allow the client to ignore its own edit. Um, this proposal is a way to allow the server to not send it back in the first place. I, I, I see that now. Cool. Yeah, a couple other quick comments. Um, yeah, I, I think there are ways to do this to implement the OT solution on top of versioning by, um, well, if, if the server's happy to rewrite the version the client sends, so you could like send, you know, do some hacks. Um, and Greg, to your comment, yeah, I would, I would also, I also kind of agree with you, and I'd love to see that as a proposal written up. Um, that'd, be, that'd be sweet. Like the more that I think about OT, the more that having a client ID sequence number pair for versions makes a huge amount of sense to me. Um, but I think that's like a different conversation. So, um, so we... Version content part of the specification? That's What's what that Greg part? was suggesting. He, he, he's saying that making the version content, the version structure, uh, part of their uh, specification, braid specification? So, sort of, no, just the, um, I, what I was saying is, so both AutoMerge and YJS use these Lamport timestamps, which consist of a, mm -hmm. an actor ID and a number. And I was just proposing that we use that uh, in braid in a more um, regimented way, like this, our versions are that. If we did that, then we'd have the advantage of the versions would be as the same size, I argue, and they would give us a little bit more information that is useful and could be used in this case here as well, because that actor ID you could also use in the way that Mike wants to have the server not have to send back um, edits to the person that it received them from. I guess, I yeah, I've seen actually a similar proposal that is a little bit more complex, but provides more functionality. I'll post the link to Discord because I was interested in um, any feedback on that. Yeah, I think I would uh, support that. You know, I'll be very interested in coming up with counterexamples, <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, but I think the okay. discussion is <laughs> probably like quite useful. Um, and also for uh, for official conversations, like stuff that you want everyone to, to be able to look at, uh, you do use the mailing list if you can. The, the Discord is designed to be something that people are free to ignore. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, I'll post a new. Uh, I was thinking about responding to the version discussion, and I wasn't sure whether to continue there or just start a new thread. Um, I can start a new one. Okay. Um, so are we going to put this for now? Is that the consensus? I think so. Yeah. yeah does, do you have any objections to punting? No. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is like there's a, a that game papers please like the the bureaucratic dystopia. <laughs> Postpone. 
<laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, I think we've dealt with most of these issues. It's it's on. We've been going for two hours now, and um, uh, yeah, we've gone separate like lines of where it needs to be. Um, so there's these two last issues remaining. Um, I don't. <laughs> there's a part of me that just wants to kind of go gangbusters and see if we can get them sorted now. Uh, Go ahead and read them. I think times. we could do the the blank wines one actually, because um, Carell had a proposal there that I thought was good, and I'd like to see if we want to just adopt his proposal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Should I summarize? So, those? Yes, please. Okay. So um, the idea here is that we have to know how to separate versions from each other, and um, likewise, we need to be able to separate patches from each other, and you know so. The, the first way that you know that you can, the end of a version is with a content length or the end of a version or a, um, is with content length or if the version has multiple patches, then you count the number of patches. Mm -hmm. And um, likewise for a patch, you know the end of it with its content length. We also have in here separating everything with double with a blank line. And the blank line is necessary in, to separate headers from body but the blank line is not strictly necessary to know when the end of the body happens because we know the end of the body from the content length or the patches header. And so in some sense, we could call that last blank line optional. It's kind of nice when you look at it because it helps you visually distinguish where the next thing starts, but it's not necessary in the protocol. And uh, so I wrote an implementation just assuming there's blank lines, except for an implementation that assumed there were no blank lines because they weren't defined anywhere. And then Corel mentioned, suggested that, well, what we could do is say that when reading it, um, you want to be permissive and allow blank lines optionally, and but also work if they're not. And when writing it, maybe we should be restricted and always add the blank lines. So yeah, here is the servers restricted, must include the new line after body patch and the container version. Clients permissive should tolerate missing blank lines. Uh, so I'd like to hear if anyone has any thoughts on that proposal. Um, I like the idea of it being permissive because that also uh, neatly solves the um, open issue around heartbeat messages. Um, since then we can just send extra heartbeat messages by sending extra new lines between versions, um, which is very cute and neat. Um, and that's already implemented my client. Uh, my preference would be to make it restrictive. I, like, I really like this as a model. I would change this to say it must not include the new, new line. Um, I think that's more cohesive and more consistent with how HTTP currently works, where if in a single connection I send two, if there's like request response, request response within the same HTTP connection, not using braid, then it's request, uh, then the response um, does not have a new line after the body before the next um, data comes back from that peer. You're saying using HTTP 1.1 keep alive? that reuses a TCP mm -hmm. connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no extra new lines before the second header in the response. Thank you. So I, I really like the new lines as a sort of backwards compatible way of seeing, for example, with curl, um, kind of as a sanity check when I'm <laughs> subscribing to something and I want to see my data in raw form. It's very easy to identify visually um, where things separate when we have a new line. And I think it would be difficult if, especially if there were zero new lines, it would be especially difficult to see headers mashed up against previous um, content. So I agree with you. And for what it's worth though, um, all of the patches that we're sending back, actually you know, basically a lot of our examples at the moment, we're always sending back JSON. And so you can always just append an extra new line at the end of a JSON string. That's valid. So. I so your the content your, length bigger. Your suggestion is to include that in the content length as a as a general practice, but not in the spec. Yeah, that's that's my preference. That would be my preference as well. And in fact, I would specify if you want to specify the new line, just specify one new line after body because you want to be really, really specific that only one is expected. Even so, more than one would be accept uh, accept. I'm also with, with Dwayne. I, I, I think that having the extra new line uh, is a nice visual separator. And I think that's important to be able to see that. 
um, even beyond just using JSON. And if we used JSON, then would we have a should in there say that if you're using JSON that you should add a new line at the end of the JSON when you can also have a, an optional new line in between I, the versions? I can, I can see the argument. This is similar to should JSON be minified or um, tabs with you know spacing and things like that. It's a formatting question at that point. And if you want your resource to show formatted JSON or compact JSON, that's really like a, an application um, choice. Um, but I mean, conceptually, what we're separating here are the versions or the patches. We're not conceptually trying to make the JSON pretty. Well, you're trying to make the yeah. response pretty so that you can read it, right? And I, I, um, I guess I agree. I didn't know this before, but given that the HTTP, that there is some precedence, you might say, um, for not having a new line there, I, I feel like not having a new line there, I guess I'm in favor of that. That's the idea that if people want the kind of uh, visual separation that Dwayne is interested in, that there's this easy and clever hack of adding a new line inside the JSON without changing the spec. Um, and if your JSON library doesn't support that, just bump the content length value. If your library doesn't support it. I mean, just entering arbitrary new line. So sometimes you fix with what library does, but yeah. yeah. There are well, easy ways to do it. If you're, I mean, if you're writing an application, um, so like I'm writing, I'm writing an application code in my, on my server like using, so this would be like on top of the Braid protocol library, on top of the Braidify library. When I'm putting my JSON encoding the patch, I have to know to add a new line at the end of that patch in order to make what's coming over the protocol look nice. That seems like the wrong separation of concerns. But it seems like it's well, just for yourself. It's like you're in a situation like Dwayne is in where you're programming something. It's not for yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is like I'm connecting this if I'm connecting to someone else's server and I want to make I want to see how the sub subscriptions are coming over nice so I can parse it in my client. It's nice if I can read the protocol messages from some other server and not have to say, oh, hey, you know, when you program this, you have to edit your JSON patches consistently on each one to add a new line so that they look nice. Um, that you seems more like it. something to put into the protocol. Like you can still read it even if there's no new lines there. It just means that it kind of runs on and yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I don't, it sounds I don't, like we disagree. Definitely disagree. Yeah, so we might want to not uh, try to settle this right now. Um, so in my implementation, I wasn't sure. I didn't even want to go look up the spec. I just kind of did what my intuition told me to do. And it was make it look pretty by inserting you know, proper visual spacing. Um, so that's the way I'm implementing it right now. Um, but Seth, you mentioned you like the servers restrictive clients permissive model, I think you mentioned. Um, I've yeah. been wanting to bring this up before, but I just want to confirm that you guys are aware of the robustness principle. Yeah. I think that's what you're talking about. I think that's what applies here. And it's like the third time that this is kind of come up in my mind. Um, yeah, uh, seems like the robustness principle, in my opinion, would dictate that you have the client can, uh, or the server can emit something pretty and the clients will just pick it up. Yeah. Um, yeah the I, only I maybe, I go for it. The um, I don't know. I don't know what the robustness principle is exactly, but uh, broadly speaking, I assume the principle is to try to design it in such a way where as many things as possible are likely to work. Um, and the only danger of violating uh, that is that, it, um, like, it might be that the people who are like the the da the danger would be people who are writing the thing to parse this might. Um, naturally, you might say, expect there to not be a new line because there isn't in this 
or system in HTTP. Um, yeah. Um, what the odds of that are. Anyway, I, I don't know what the resolution of this should be. I feel like there's a bunch of different competing concerns. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's like, do we just put this to a vote? Is that, is that how this should work? Like, um, well, I, I think we have consensus right now. I think that's, I think well, we're... yeah, I think, I think we've got consensus on this as a, as a principle. Um, I think the only question is whether or not if the server must do something, whether it must always include a new line or whether it should not do that. Um, uh, but clients will be permissive anyway. So as I said, my preference is must not. Sounds like your preference, Mike, is must. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just not sure how that gets resolved. I don't think more discussion is going to. I'm not convinced that more discussion I'm not sure why we have a contradiction clear. here. We can say it includes the new line, but it just means that the server needs to adjust the content length appropriately. And that's it. No, that doesn't. Well, the problem with that is that um, there's going to be some patch types where that new line is semantically rich. So it's it's not like we can just arbitrarily add a new line to any kind of patch, because that's not the case. So we can, as a convention, add an extra new line for patches that are like JSON possible. But um, if it's a binary patch or something, then that new line wouldn't appear. Oh, sorry, you couldn't just add a new line after the binary patch, because that would mean exactly. something. Exactly. But then it becomes even more important, because here I can technically uh, provide some, I can archive this content and send appropriate uh, header that tells the client that it needs to unarchive it. And I'm not sure if I do want to or don't want to see the new line at the end. Imagine it's all binary content. Do we still want to have an empty line there? Well, no, but yeah, so to be really, really clear what I'm saying, I, I'm, very, I'm very convinced that the content length should not include the new line, regardless of whether or not this next new line appears um, in the uh, yeah in the service response. Um, but yeah, if there's a binary version of this protocol, um, that would there would be a lot of changes other than just you know what the headers would look like in this new line. Yeah, the problem with making Unless it you're binary. Talking about... mm, first. The problem making it binary is that then you'd have um, you know there'd be new lines and things in the binary. You couldn't control what the binary had are you guys just talking about binary I mean, content or I, like sorry i, I took that back <laughs> um i was i never mind what i said um seth i don't think it would make sense to say must not include the new line after body patch and container version because elsewhere we're also saying the server may add as many new lines as it wishes to keep a heartbeat so i think the only option is either must or should here or, or just nothing at all on the server. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy with that. I'd be happy with should. Um, Wait, what was what was your comment, Dwayne? Well, it wouldn't make sense because we in another proposal, which I think we're all on board with, um, we want to add new lines as a means of keeping heartbeat alive, a, a heartbeat signal um, in a subscribe. Oh. So we know that new lines, as many new lines as we want are optional and in fact encouraged in a particular scenario. So um, I don't think that we can say that in the, in the restrictive case for the servers here, um, we cannot say that it must not include the new line after the body because elsewhere we're saying that it can include a new line after the body. I think you can still, I, I, I hear what you're saying and it, what it sounds like to me is that the client deal with the fact that there might be new lines, but it seems to be the case breaking. that the server must not. It's breaking up uh, a bit for me. I'm not sure if I heard testing. all that. Okay. Testing. Maybe testing. just say it Am again. Back? Yeah. Okay. If, uh, right. uh, it sounds like to me phrase. that. Uh, Let go again. Go, we'll get there. Test, testing. Am I back? <laughs> okay. I'll try again. Yeah. Um, am I still here? Testing, oh, goodness, okay. Um, it sounds like to me, the client, um, sorry, if the, the <laughs> it sounds like to me that the, based on what Dwayne said, the client must deal with the fact that there may or may not be new lines. I agree with that based on, based on if we wanna support that. Uh, um, but it seems like this here could still require with a must that the server not 
put a new line there. I agree that the client will never be able to hold the server to that. The client will never know that that wasn't really just a ping that it put there. Um, but anyway, it's just, there's no, um, even though it's unenforceable, the document can still but, say. But like we're planning you, elsewhere in the spec to say that the server may send new lines for the purpose of sending a heartbeat. And right, so that so would be self-contradictory for the server to may send new lines and also must not. No, the reason it wouldn't be self-contradictory is that this is saying a reason that the new line is being sent. And what you would be effectively saying is that the only reason that the server can send a new line is for a heartbeat. Um, I mean, that, I'm just saying that's a, it could be spec that way. And okay, that'd be different language that. than we're talking about here. Different language, I think it's semantically the same. So I, increasingly what I'm, what I'm feeling is servers either should or may include the new line after body patch and so on. Clients must tolerate, you know, missing new line or any number of new lines or something like that. Um, do we, I'm seeing nods from Mike and Dwayne. Do we have consensus on that? We'll be happy with merging that change if we did it. I, I think we have like rough consensus for this idea. And um, it's probably worth also considering in uh, with that heartbeat spec, uh, that heartbeat issue. Um, and I think that um, I think probably it seems like we have rough consensus for this idea. And what we want to do is get a write up of a specific spec now that we can evaluate a PR on. That sounds good to me. Um, cool. Well, we're 20 minutes over time. To, this would apply to new lines below in the example as well, right? It would be exactly the same logic because it says, yeah, you see it says one new line because, and then some explanation. So in this case, it would also be between patches, it would also allow uh, more than one new line, right? Or more than yeah. zero new line. Okay. Yeah. And I also just, right. some things, I don't want to take up too much time, but just I'm realizing that if content length is set exactly to the end of that JSON string and we had mm -hmm. zero new lines after that, then would it be close bracket and then V E R S I O N with absolutely no blank lines in between? Like would it would the version yeah. appear on the same line as the JSON? It could, yeah. That's correct. Which I know that's upsets you deeply. That's how Seth, you're emitting it. I think I saw the other night. Right. Yeah. 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 That's right. It looked so much harder to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, my client supports either way. And to make it work with uh with Mike's Bridge.js implementation, I added extra new lines there. Um yeah. anyway, but yeah, I, I that, agree with you. On that discussion, nobody here thinks that it's easier to read putting it after. The only reason that the people it is like has to do with standards. Consistency with HTTP, um, but I mean, maybe it doesn't matter that much. Uh, so, and also, everyone agrees that the content length should. I mean, it's just a question of framing, right? So, like, there's two ways that HTTP frames. One way is for headers to the body, you have two new lines, and then from the start of the body to the end of the body, it's content length. So, in my mind, there's like these two framing systems: content length or double new lines at the end of the headers. And the the reason why I don't like the extra extra double new lines at the end of the body is like, huh? Like that's not a framing system. Like that's just an arbitrary thing. That's like a another kind of thing, which is just styling, um, which gets ignored anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, that's that's my take on that. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm happy to change my code to work either way. Um, yeah. Anyway, in any case, I would like to move on from this. If we're happy with this, then maybe someone can put together a PR that will express that in the spec, and then we can have a bit of further discussion and then hopefully merge it um, in time for O3, whenever that is, so. Yeah, when is O3? When are we trying to finish this by? Good question. How many issues do we have left now? Um, almost none. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't want to lose this and... Uh, uh, there's... 
So I think we've talked about this. We've talked about everything except for um, this today. So we talked about this, we talked about this, we talked about that, we talked about that, and we talked about that. So there's five issues now. And I think we've got a resolution on all of them, uh, except for the, um, except for this one. Or at least we've got a path, path forward for each of them. I'm kind of thinking we want to aim for a month from now. What do you guys think? Kind of rather do it me. sooner. Do you think it? Do you think it needs to drag out to that that long? I mean, we're really close here. Well, I I, I was thinking a few weeks, or it would take like a two weeks, uh, two months ago, or a month and a half ago, or something like that. And so I'm, like, yeah, I'd rather it sooner too. But just kind of looking at our trajectory so far. Mm. And it's also not something that, like sometimes if things seem simple and then other thoughts come up and you have to kind of allow, allow for that. Like, yeah, that's true. by the way, Seth, I, I really liked your explanation of why you don't like that extra new line that you gave just now, that it's this third thing and that's superfluous. I'm like, ah, okay, I get that. And uh, this is a part of the enriching experience that I enjoy through these, these, this consensus process. It's like, I get to learn more by seeing things from through more people's eyes. Yeah, thanks for saying so. Um, yeah, and I totally hear you about it being ugly and hard to read. Uh, everybody, I get it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I would like to, well, how about this as a goal? I'd like to, by two weeks time, have some answer for every single one of these issues. They don't have to be merged, but I'd like to be like, great, you know, can we close every one of these issues? So the goal will be in two weeks time to be able to close all of these issues outstanding in the milestones. Um, and with the anticipation that there's probably going to be like one or two where, you know, there's some more stuff that comes up from the actual PR or something. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely do want to be respectful of people's time there, even though I'm like itching to talk about this last one, but um, maybe we can we can talk about that offline maybe. Yeah, we're about 24 um, minutes over. We are. So um, yeah, I'll write up the my notes on the separate versions thing. Um, I think we have a consensus on that. Hopefully, <laughs> please comment and disagree with me on the issue if you do disagree. Um, there's a couple of different PRs we need to put together for some of the other issues that we talked about, but we can we can do that. Um, either I'll throw something together or um, you know Michael Dwayne or anyone who feels keen, uh, feel free to jump on that. Um, but otherwise, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, this is I think the end of the official part of today. Um, unless there's anything else that anyone wants to talk about before we wrap up, I'll bring up. Thank you. I have one thing. Maybe just on the record, just maybe we can take it immediately off, but uh, the whole patching, Jason patch, Jason pointer thing, that was a rabbit hole that I wasn't expecting. And I thought it might have come up here because there was some chatter in the chat. Um, any guidance on that? Or should I just go back to the spec and reread it? Because I'm trying these various syntaxes and it just, they aren't uh, jiving with one another as I thought they might. For doing pointers? For doing, for sending range patches? The range patch syntax, I thought that that would be more of a standard. It seemed to work with JSON patch, but you guys don't seem to be um, like re, I don't know. Uh, you seem to be wanting to move past Jason patch or use something else. I don't know. I'm kind of confused with it right now. I have a, what may help in this. There's, so sync nine uses JSON. It synchronizes a, a JSON blob and it uses JSON patches to talk about it. But the braid protocol itself is larger thinking than sync nine and wants to include things that may not be JSON blobs that are being synced and may need some other way to talk about their inner parts. Yeah, um, just a point of clarification. There is an IETF spec called JSON patch. So when we're talking about JSON patches, we could be talking about the IETF 
JSON patch spec, or we could be talking about patches that happen to express JSON. So I just want to like yeah. make that really clear. Yeah, so I was I was not talking about the official. I, I was using the words, but I was using it to refer to something that we're doing in house. Yeah, I was so, trying to figure out you. what Angelo's question was because I didn't understand either. So did I address? Was I talking about? Was that the range of your question? Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, so the spec doesn't it say you can give it a patch type JSON patch? And then you're using the official jsonpatch.com. The J okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, maybe this will help. The, there's a so there's been an ongoing discussion between me and Mike for like the last year or two. Mike's perspective is we want Braid just to have one way of expressing patches. They should work for everything. We can convert between. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mike. Uh, all right. I'm not going to call this the Mike perspective. I'm going to call this a perspective. I think there's value in this in having a standard way to express patches where every application can understand that we're talking about patches in the same kind of way. There's another perspective, which is that there's lots of ways that we can express patches and different CRDTs are going to want to do their own application specific thing. So we want to make a protocol that just has an arbitrary content type the same way we have a content type for content. We've got an arbitrary patch type. So we've got application specific semantics on how patches are expressed. And a system that does operational transform might do something different from a system that does CRDTs which might do something different from Photoshop. If you want to do multi-layer Photoshop, maybe that does something, something else again. So there's these two perspectives and we've ended up in a compromised position where Braid the spec has a like standard official way of expressing patches, which is the content ranges type, which Mike's put together. And um, you know, Mike uh, and Greg uh, collectively slowly, but, you know, but surely convincing me that this does let us do interoperable changes with things like AutoMerge, um, which is what Greg was trying before. Um, but there's still an escape patch, which I'm very thankful for, which is that if you want, you can specify, you know, content type or patch type, depending on whether or not Dwayne's um, uh, PR gets through, uh, where you say, actually, the content type is, you know, um, JSON OT. The patch type is uh, JSON patch, which references the ITF spec. Um, the patch type is whatever else you want. So that's like a point of confusion, I think. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question at all, Angela? Please clarify. Yeah, it does. So there's like this... Uh first class version and then you can the escape hatch is what really drives it home so multiple options maybe i could give my perspective um there are multiple types of patches multiple patch types and http already allows multiple patch types in the spec for the patch method uh it's very useful it, it could be very useful to have a general patch type that could represent the patches from many different patch types, you know, but in a general format. So one more level of consensus, instead of just having consensus to choose a type, let's have consensus of using the same representation of different types of patches. And so that's the, the content, the range patch is a proposal of a general type of patch that is also connected to HTTP's range requests. See you, Bryn. <laughs> And so it generalizes range requests, which with patches as well. So they're all kind of the same thing. Okay, Make, makes much more sense now, thank you. <laughs> and it'd probably be good to write up this stuff in the spec somewhere so it makes more sense. Cause it, it is kind of confusing and we're probably working on that. So. I'll reread that section with this vantage point and I'll let you know if it's much easier and what could be added. <laughs> Um, let's stop the recording. Uh...